Good morning, and I, uh, I welcome you to uh, one, of our, one of our final meetings of the year. We only have a few left, and this is, I think, one of the most important, and I'm really delighted to be here. I'm going to have Nicole uh, make a formal introduction for Judge Stevenson, class of 1975, in a moment. And I just would point out that uh, right after her remarks, if you'd like to meet her or be part of the Q&A in the faculty room, please come by there. And Judge Stevenson will be here on campus for a good bit for the next 36 hours. So if you have a chance and you'd like to say hello to her, don't, uh, don't hesitate to do so. Now, when I arrived at Taft as a, as a new upper mid in the fall of 1976, I had heard Karen Stevenson's name, even though she had graduated the year before. And you know how that can happen in a place like this. Uh, each class, there are graduates who have a legacy that you're still talking about years later. It may be because of their accomplishments on the athletic field or on the stage or in scholarship or in arts or just force of personality. They leave a legacy and you're still talking about them a year or two later. And that was the case with her. And then over the years, we came to know each other. I would see her on my visits, uh, alumni visits in California. I invited her back to Taft. Uh, she's spoken to the school and also to student leaders. And my respect and admiration for her is great. So today marks a really special moment as we recognize her as this year's recipient of the Horace Dutton Taft Alumni Medal. And you need to know a little bit about this. The medal is simply put the highest honor that the school bestows on a graduate. And each year, an independent committee, which is made of alumni and former and present faculty members, select a graduate <clears throat> whose life work best typifies our non sibi motto, our motto not to be served but to serve. And you can imagine the enormity of the task of this committee of extraordinarily committed men and women who have to look at the thousands of alumni who are in inspiring, leading inspiring lives and serving others. And they have to choose one. And it's the highest honor, and it's an entirely independent committee. I have nothing to do with it other than to receive a phone call on that Monday morning telling me of their decision. They take this task with the deepest sense of obligation and honor. And then the recipient traditionally addresses the school, as will be the case today. And I just close by this before I ask Nicole to come up. Karen's a woman of singular and inspiring accomplishments in, in service and in leadership, as you'll soon hear. But she's profoundly humble. And I'm guessing that she would agree with me in saying that she sat in the very seats that you are today. She was once you. And there's nothing more affirming than the simple fact that each of you can serve. And I like thinking, and I think this all the time, that there is a future alumni medal winner walking the halls today. So I ask co-head monitor Nicole Balbuena to make the introduction of Taft's graduate of 1975, Judge Karen Stevenson. Good morning, everyone. I'm honored to be here to help celebrate Judge Karen Stevenson's return to Taft to speak at this morning's meeting. Karen Stevenson entered Taft as a lower maid in the fall of 1971, a member of the first group of female students admitted to Taft. She was a school monitor, an honorable student, a class committee member, a member of the Glee Club, the Afro-American Congress, the school touring program, and the discipline committee. She was on the track team and was cross country manager and varsity track manager. Karen was awarded the National Merit Commendation, the Harvard Book Prize, the National Achievement Scholarship, and was inducted into the Cum Laude Society while at Taft. She received the 1908 Medal of Scholarship at the Taft commencement and was a recipient of the Moorhead Scholarship of UNC Chapel Hill, where she was in the first class of women at Moorheads in 1975. At UNC, Karen set school records for the women's track team, where she was team captain, as well as a member of the Phi Beta Kappa. After winning a Rhodes Scholarship in 1979, she was off to the University of Oxford, where she was the first woman from UNC and the first African-American woman in the nation to receive this honor. After graduating from Oxford, she spent several years working in the business sector. Stanford University followed, where she received her JD and began her career as an attorney. In 2015, she was appointed as a United States Magistrate Judge to the U.S. District Court, Central District of California. 
Judge Stevenson will be in the faculty room after morning meeting for anyone who would like to join for a Q&A. Please join me in welcoming Judge Karen Stevenson. Wow, thank you guys. Good morning, Taft. How are you? Good to see you. I had to be careful not to like step on my cape on the way up here after that introduction, but <laughs> sounds like a lot. There's a reason why uh, my senior year, I was actually voted uh, in the yearbook. I don't know if you guys still do this, like fingers in every pie. Literally, that was my moniker. So it's really good to be back. I'm really humbled. I'm really honored. I didn't think I was going to cry, but I felt like I was going to cry. Um, hearing Mr. Mack's comments and to see all of you, especially the seniors, you guys are one foot out of this joint. <laughs> like you're gone in three weeks. So I really appreciate you being here. No seniors here? Where are the seniors? Thank you for coming. Like you don't have to be here at all. So cool. Anyway, um, it's a real honor to be here. I have a few remarks to share with you. Um, it's I had a really, I struggled with what to say this morning, and so I'm gonna need a little participation. So I have two slides. This is a picture of my swearing in at the Central District, the Federal Court in 2015. So that's kind of like now, my life now as a judge, it's busy, I love my job, it's wonderful, it's hard on certain days, and I have to explain to people that what is legal and what's fair are not always the same thing. So there's that issue. Um, but there's that, but there's all the stuff that happened in between sitting in these seats and that. So I wanted to do what was useful to you guys. So we're going to have a little choose your adventure experience here. <laughs> I have two presentations presented. I can talk about what I do now as a federal judge, or I can talk a little bit about the space in between, like my life between being in these seats and how I got here and moving away from this place and things that are meaningful to me. So let's have a show of hands. Who wants to hear about what I do now? Who wants to hear about how I got here? Thank you. OK, let's do that. <laughs> Just I want to do what's useful. That's what matters to me. So where to start? Thank you again, Mr. Mack. Great to see everybody and the faculty here. It is a real pleasure to be back here at Taft, and I'm really, really humbled and honored to get, this is a most unexpected um, award. I came to Taft in the fall of 1971 as a lower mid from Washington, D.C. I went to public school. Um, I only applied to one boarding school, otherwise I was gonna go to a day school in Washington, D.C. I had not heard of any other boarding schools. It turned out that Taft was going co-ed the following fall, and my mom worked for the public school system in Washington, D.C., and Taft was looking for female faculty members, and one of my mom's colleague's daughter had graduated from Vassar and was interviewing to teach history at Taft because they needed some female teachers, right? So Val came here, she interviewed for the job, she was like, mm, I don't really want to teach here, but there's this kid in Washington, D.C., I think, who's looking at at private schools, why don't you send her a catalog? Literally, I got a Taft catalog in the mail over the transom. I applied to the school, and I was not an ABC student. My mom had to pay part of my tuition. And when the financial aid washed out, it was gonna cost us out of pocket about the same for me to come to Taft as it was for me to like go to National Cathedral or Sidwell Friends in Washington, D.C. So I was like 14. I was like, I think I'll go to boarding school. That's how I ended up here. Most improbable, truly, truly improbable. We drove up here in the fall of, and that's me in the ninth grade. Um, in case you're wondering, I'm the one on the front row on the end with the, the dorky knee socks on. Right, that's me as a lower mid. <laughs> and in 19, that's probably in the yearbook in 1972, that's also, except for two people, that was the entirety of the students of color at this school the entirety. The woman in the front row, her name was Elizabeth. She was from Birmingham, Alabama. She was a junior. She was an upper mid when I was a lower mid. We were the only black girls in the school that year. That's it. That's all she wrote. Um, Taft has changed a lot. 
and it's the values of this place that have made that change. So let me talk a little bit about how I got from there to being a federal judge. One of the things um, I learned here was that I was never in a space that looked like me, <laughs> never. I was never in a space um, with people who had much of my experience. There were over the years, you know, there were other African American students here. We got lots of foreign students from other countries, but I never assumed that I was going to be familiar. <laughs> so I always felt a little bit on the outside. That wasn't a bad thing, clearly. I mean, I love being in school here. I, I had a fabulous time. I have good friends. I'm going to see some of my classmates this weekend, and they are very dear to me. But what I learned was to figure it out. I learned to be brave. I learned to be solitary. I learned to just put my head down and get it done, even when it was hard. And I also learned that there were adults in this place who were deeply caring, not just about me, but about all the kids and all the teenagers in this community. And I hope that is true for you, that you have found a teacher or a coach or an advisor or just a friend who will be, the, be your person, <laughs> be your person when stuff doesn't look good. So one of the things that um, Nicole mentioned was in between the Rhodes Scholarship and going to Stanford Law School, I worked in the business sector. Well, let's unpack that a little bit. I spent 12 years, 12 years after I graduated from Oxford, kind of bumping around, seriously. I was supposed to go to Yale Law School when I came back from Oxford, and I just had this moment where I was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I'm doing this because everybody expects me to do it. I'm not sure that's what I want to do. I don't know why I'm going to law school. I'm going to law school because I didn't apply to med school. I didn't have a profound, meaningful reason for myself to do that. So I traveled around, and I did a lot of weird jobs. Like, all of this looks kind of sexy and successful now, but some of the other stuff that I did was I worked at a restaurant a Western Sizzlin restaurant. I suck as a waitress, let me just tell you. I worked at a dry cleaners. I lived in a commune. I became a certified water aerobics instructor. I ran two marathons. I milked cows, um, ran a spa, and had a set of twins. That, all that happened before I went back to law school. I was 37 years old when I finally decided to go to law school. And I went to law school then because I had a reason to go. And I tell you, that was not an easy time. Like, you know, the first African-American woman to win the Rhodes Scholarship, you know. The Washington Post interviewed me. You guys can Google me. I'm sure you have already have. There's an article, even um, Lance Auden, who was the headmaster at the time, told the Washington Post, we're very disappointed. We're not quite sure what's going on here. Um, my sister uh, was interviewed by the Washington Post, and, they, and she was like, why isn't she doing something with her brain? Uh, it was really weird. It was really painful. I disappointed a lot of people. Between this and being sworn in as a federal judge, I disappointed a lot of people. But that's what it took for me to find my own footing and my own reason to be doing what I wanted to do. And when I finally went to law school, it was because that's what I wanted to do. I had worked in a business for a number of years, and I remember the day the CEO of the company, I was like, I don't want his job. But every time the company would have a legal issue, they would call me, why, and ask me to work, be the client rep with the lawyer. And I was sitting in a deposition with our hired retained counsel from a very fancy law firm in Los Angeles. And I looked over at Jim, and it suddenly occurred to me, I want your job. <laughs> and it was like, oh, I know how to run a business. I know what makes sense. I know how to make difficult decisions about employees and all that. So it was at that point then I started to um, follow through with applying to law school and actually going to law school. But by that time, I was also going to law school with 18-month-old twin boys. This was totally backwards, guys. Do, do not try this at home. Your parents will not recommend <laughs> doing it this way. But this is, what, this is what happened to me. So my thing is to try not to be so obsessed with what people expect you to do. What you really need to do is find what matters to you. Um, and it's a huge honor to have this 
medal. Because as a ninth grader, a 10th grader, an 11th grader, a 12th grader, I walked these very halls, and I'm telling you, we looked around and looked at all those pictures hanging on the wall. They're like 900 old white men, maybe five women. And I thought, it never occurred to me that my picture would be on that wall. Never in a zillion years. But that tells you about this place, that tells you about this school, and it tells you, I hope, about you and what's possible for you and that it doesn't have to be a straight line. You're not gonna get it all right. You are going to disappoint people, but if you can find your own North Star, your own North Star in whatever way that matters to you, that is how you serve. You don't, I don't think we necessarily serve our times by coloring inside the lines. Just having good grades and going to the best colleges and then go to grad school and then you're top of your class and then you're this. Maybe that'll happen to you. I don't know, that's fine. But what do you love? What do you really care about? And how do you treat people? Do that. And you will serve in whatever ways are meaningful for you. I spent 10 years as a selector in Southern California on the Rhodes Scholarship Selection Committee. And you know, you see these amazing resumes for kids, amazing transcripts from schools all over the country. And you know what I did with every single resume? I would go to the transcript and look for the lowest grade they ever got. The lowest grade they ever got, why? Because it's easy to be good in your major, it's easy to just take classes in what you're good at. But who, you know, where are the physics majors that took a poetry class and maybe didn't do all that well in it? Where are the math majors who took a Shakespeare seminar? Where are the Shakespeare seminars, you know, the English majors who may have, wow, taken physics for poets and didn't get the greatest grade, but they tried. Be brave, that's my point. Be brave, and I looked for in those candidates, I wanted to talk to interesting people. I wanted to have finalists for the Rhodes Scholarship who hadn't just gotten the best grades and the highest grades in the easy stuff. We would ask, I would ask them, tell me about a time you failed and how'd that work out for you? What did you do? How'd you recover from that? I don't think failure is a bad thing. I think failure gets a bad rap. Because honestly, any athletes in here, people play on teams? Okay, when you win, do you think much about how you won? You don't care how you won. You won, right? A win is a win. But when you lose, and when you lose a close game, boy, you play that game over and over and over in your head, right? <laughs> You, that play, that one jump shot, that one field goal, you play that over and over in your head, and I think it's because we learn more from our losses, we learn more from our failures than we necessarily do from our successes. So don't be afraid to do the things that you think may be hard, to do the things that may be unfamiliar, or to go off the beaten path, because I think those things strengthen you they absolutely strengthen you. So, try not to be so obsessed with what people expect of you. All of you are already leaders, trust me about that. You're here, you're talented, you're smart, and even if you're not as smart as you thought you were when you got here, none of us turned out to be as smart as we thought we were before we got here. <laughs> we found that there were a lot of people much smarter than us, and some people who just worked harder than us, there is that. But you don't have to wait for some day to do the thing that matters to you and to make a difference in the world right where you are. The needs of the world are urgent, they are immediate, and your contribution is absolutely needed, absolutely needed. So the late Toni Morrison is one of my favorite authors, and what she received in 2013 the Nichols Chancellor Award at Vanderbilt University. And in her address on that occasion, she said this, the ethics of affluence insist upon civic obligations. And when we assume that obligation, we reveal not our solitary good, but our dependence on others. None of us is alone. Each of us is dependent on others. Some of us depend on others for life itself. Don't we all know that after a year and a half of a pandemic and a million lives lost to COVID-19? Your opportunity here 
your opportunity here at Taft and in three weeks, wherever you seniors are going. <laughs> you are singularly more able, more than any previous generation, not because you're smarter, although you may be, she said, or because you have tools your predecessors lacked, but because you have time. Time is on your side, as is a chance to fashion an amazing future. Relish it, use it, revel in it. So I offer you this morning, at one of the last morning meetings of the year, as the school year winds down, the words of Toni Morrison, relish and revel the time you have right now. And as you prepare to either come back to Taft in the fall or move into your college experience or gap year or whatever comes next for you, I simply say this to you. Be brave, be authentic, and don't wait. <laughs>